Our gospel lesson today is from the Good News according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. We're on page six in the New Testament. Matthew chapter five, beginning at verse 38, concerning retaliation. Jesus is speaking. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you. And do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said... You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For you, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks. Let us pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today's sermon is going to be more of a verse-by-verse Bible study, so you're welcome to keep your Bibles open to Matthew, uh, to our Gospel lesson if you like, or you can just listen in. Whatever works for you is just fine with me. Before I begin on specifically on our lesson for today, I want to back up just a little bit and remind you of how we got here. A few weeks ago, we started where Jesus starts something that's commonly called the Sermon on the Mount. And just like how Moses had gone up on the mountain and brought down God's law, the Torah, the teaching, so Jesus goes up on this mountain and he begins to teach the law again, but this time in a new way, reinterpreting, uh, raising the bar, if you will. You may recall that we talked about how Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, Blessed are the meek, and so forth. He points out that God blesses those who the world doesn't bless. Things are turned upside down, that this is not what we expect. Then he goes on to preach about, you are the salt of the world. You are the light. I was thinking about this, that when you think about salt... Salt is really best when it's spread around and gives food kind of a boost, zesty flavor. But if there's no food, then the salt is just salt, just saltiness. And I think it's interesting that we had that passage on the day we celebrated Super Bowl Sunday when we thought about world hunger, when we came together to give financial gifts and food gifts. We need to feed the hungry so that we can be that salt so that we can be that light in the world. Right after that, Jesus starts in with some really hard teaching. He's already kind of set the bar high, as I mentioned, turned things upside down and on their head. But then he goes on to teach about anger and how if you're angry with somebody, that's as bad as if you actually murder them. He goes on to talk about adultery, And that if you've thought about that in your heart, that's just as bad as doing the actual action of adultery. He goes on to talk about divorce and not cheapening relationships. And then he says that we shouldn't swear oaths to things. Just say yes, yes, or no, no. We got to the end of that, and and I talked about how our reaction to that is, "Uh uh-oh, I'm in trouble. I'm not doing what Jesus says I need to do. And today, he raises the ante again. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. 
Where have we heard that? It's not one of the Ten Commandments. What Jesus is talking about here with that phrase, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, is something called the Hammurabi Law Code. There was a man named Hammurabi who had a big army and they were conquering all kinds of lands. And this was happening way back before the time of Moses. And as he conquered different lands, he came to the conclusion that he wanted one unified law, a set of rules for everybody to follow. And so an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, is essentially a summary of all of those laws. It was all about limiting retaliation. As he was conquering lands, he would find places where these laws weren't in place. And so if I killed one of your sheep, you might be mad enough to kill four of mine. And if you kill four of mine, I might kill eight of yours. And it just keeps escalating. And so this law code, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, meant that you couldn't exceed what was done to you. It's where we get the whole idea of let the punishment fit the crime. And it's such a reasonable idea that it has persisted to this day, even in our laws in this country. How people are sentenced and what the, what the punishment is, is supposed to be equal to the level of the crime. So Jesus takes this very common, well-accepted phrase. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, if somebody hits you on the right cheek, you don't get to hit them back. You turn and offer the other cheek as well. And we say, you mean we're supposed to end up with two sore cheeks? What is that about Jesus? Then he says... If someone wants to sue you and take your outer garment, your coat, you go ahead and give them the next layer, your cloak, as well. Just a quick show of hands. How many of you have more than one winter coat at home? Uh-huh. Me too. I wouldn't be happy if somebody took my Land's End jacket, because I really like it. But the truth is, I have another perfectly good jacket to wear. What's strange about what Jesus is saying is people in Jesus' day didn't have a huge wardrobe. In fact, many people wore all the clothing that they possessed on any given day. There was no spare coat or cloak hanging in their closet or in their home. And so in essence, what he's saying, if somebody wants your outer garment, you give them the next layer as well. He's saying you should be willing to strip down to your tunic, down to your underwear, for somebody. And again, we are like, really? You want us to go that far? And he adds to it. If somebody tells you to go one mile, you should go two. Where does this come from? Soldiers of the day, and remember that soldiers in Jesus' day were Roman soldiers from a foreign land, not even your own people. If a soldier said to you, I want you to carry my gear for a mile. You were required to do so, no matter what you were doing. You might be in the middle of the most important thing in your day. It didn't matter. If the soldier said, you go a mile, you had to drop everything, pick up his gear, and carry it for him. And Jesus says, when you do that, go a second mile. It's interesting, if you think about going a second mile in that scenario, where you're being forced into it, do you think that might actually catch the soldier off guard? Why are you going two miles? And maybe the conversation could start, well, it's because of the God I know. It's kind of an interesting thought that when we go the extra mile, it might open up a conversation. It might begin a new relationship. Then Jesus says, Give to everyone who begs from you. That's kind of dangerous, isn't it? When I was growing up, we'd go into the city and we'd go past people who appeared to be homeless. People who had out cups or hats, you know, begging for money. And sometimes my parents would give them money or they'd give my brother and sister and I money to give to them. And at other times we'd walk by. And I began to think... How do you know which is which? Who are the legitimate people and who aren't? Any of you ever have that experience? You just don't know? 
And then he says, give to anyone or let anyone borrow from you who you want to let borrow from you. And again, is there any guarantee of being paid back? In my family, my dad would say, that's the last time I let your Uncle Jerry borrow anything. He always brings it back broken. So here we are with all of these teachings. And then Jesus adds to it. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Ha! Huh. I remember the Sunday after 9-11 when the terrorists flew the jets into the Twin Towers and into the Pentagon. And I came to church and I was thinking, Lord, I don't have enough love in my heart to pray for those terrorists today. I remember thinking that. And then I'm amazed at the people who have that on a very personal level. They've experienced something like the murder of a family member. And there are these people who don't seem to harbor any hatred towards that murderer. In fact, I've heard of stories, true stories, of people who go and visit them every day in prison and pray with them and develop a relationship. I just think that's amazing because I don't know if I could do that. And then, here comes the bold-faced type, double exclamation point sentence. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. What Jesus has just done here, you know, is shown us the very heart of God. That all of these super, super hard things that he's talked about that we're supposed to do as his followers, he said that's how God is. This is who God is. That God loves those who we don't love. That God is willing to go the extra mile and to turn the other cheek. Something is very important to point out about this phrase for you. Be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. In the English language, we have three tenses. We have past, present, and future. In the Greek language, they had additional tenses. They have the past, they have the present, and in between present and future they have something that's called becoming. It's like a on the way sort of tense. And then even with the future they have something that's called the perfect past or the completed past. And so in this phrase really what Jesus is saying is Start to be made perfect or be on the path to being made perfect as God is already completely perfect. Last week in adult education classes, both in Pastor Amy's class and then in my class, we didn't know we were teaching on the same thing, but we were talking about a big church word called sanctification. And that word simply means that you're being made holy. You're being made pure. You're being separated from that which is evil and other than God. You're on the path. Now, can any of us attain perfection on this side of the grave? No. Scripture even says that. And we talked about that last week, that all of us fall short of the glory of God. No one is without sin. No one. And so what Jesus is talking about is raising this bar but reminding us that we won't achieve perfection until we reach the end. I've got to share with you a personal story about a long-time member of Trinity who passed away many years ago. His name was Wilbur Walzer. Some of you maybe would remember Wilbur. Wilbur was very rough around the edges. In fact, often on a Sunday morning, especially when it was cold outside, um, I'd smell cigarette smoke and catch him in the bathroom right across from the office is smoking a cigarette. I'd say, Wilbur, you can't smoke in here. Yeah, it's too cold outside. <laughs> One thing about Wilbur that was great is he'd come in the door and I'd say, good morning, Wilbur, how are you? Near perfect. Near perfect. So guess what we preached on at his funeral? Be perfect, therefore, Right? Wilbur never attained perfection in this life, 
but in heaven he has. Now, you and I have rough edges too. We all have the things that don't measure up. We don't turn the other cheek all the time. We don't go the second mile. We don't love our enemies like we should. And yet, God continues to forgive us as we're on that journey toward perfection, on that journey of sanctification. And so what I wanted to remind you of today is that with God's grace and mercy, day by day, God walks with us, provides for us, so that we can grow in faith until that day that we are called home and we indeed will be perfect. So, it's a fine answer if someone asks you, hey, how are you today? Near perfect. In Jesus' name, amen.